thank you very much. You can see the topic is uh, combating COVID-19, a computing perspective. So uh, I was super excited to give this lecture to this particular audience. And, and this is why I created a special slide to show how excited I am. And the reason for this excitement, as we can always understand, that, that this is the first lecture where all the audience are the best scientists of Bangladesh, the most acclaimed scientists of Bangladesh. And this, I'm, I'm highly motivated and super excited. So this is my first slide. And there's another issue that I need, I need to give a disclaimer because, oh, by the way, so one of the goal, one of the motivation of my lecture would be to, to instill uh, instill the idea that we can collaborate together individually with every one of you. Okay, so I need to start with a disclaimer because the topic says combating COVID-19. So when we say combating COVID-19, we, we think of a lot of things. I'm not doing all those things. First of all, I'm not the frontline workers. So the situation we are in now, we owe it to the frontline workers, the sacrifice they have made and so on. Also, there are researchers who are working to, to get medication, vaccination, and so on. I'm not doing th th those sort of works as well. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm using the technology, the computing te technology, and trying to do some useful research that could be useful for COVID-19 related things. And I'm doing it from a big distance from all the frontline workers. So I'm, I'm in a safe distance, and I'm doing this from a safe distance. So I start with this presentation with the hats off to the frontline workers to whom we owe all the credits for the situation we are in now. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss about is different weapons from computing. This is a non-exhaustive list. Some of the weapons that we can use to uh, work with COVID-19 related problems. And some of these works I have been involved with personally, I have the honor to be involved with personally. For example, natural language processing. Uh, we have done some works applying the natural language processing to find out some interesting aspects of COVID-19. For example, I will talk about one of these things in my uh, lecture, COVID-19 Base 2.0, which actually is a knowledge base, a automatically extracted knowledge base from the um, literature using natural language processing and so on. I will also talk about an analysis that we did on Twitter data, again, using NLP and so on. Then I will try to cover some areas where we worked using the large uh, repertoire of weapons that we have within the artificial intelligence umbrella, that is machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, and so on. We also did some post analysis on some COVID data based on USA, based on some other countries as well. Probably I will not be able to cover all those things. Uh, we also did a phylogenetic analysis on, on, on COVID-19 COVID strain, SARS-CoV-2 strain, which is very interesting, at least to me. I will try to discuss that with you so that you got also interested in the, these sort of things and so on. And finally, I will try to uh, talk about some modeling, epidemiological modeling that we can do using agent-based models or SIR models and so on. So these are a list of non-exhaustive weapons for computing, which we can use to do a lot, lot of things I'm just going to touch some of those in this talk. So I will start with the first thing that we do, which is a comprehensive knowledge base for coronaviruses. So what was the motivation behind this? You know, there are a lot of things that we can do when COVID-19 came, all our colleagues, researchers, and scientists all over the world started to work on their own ground to, to combat COVID-19 in their own way, from the research point of view, I mean. So our motivation was to provide them a knowledge base to start from that knowledge base. So we wanted to say that you start here. So what we did, we uh, tried to highlight all the biomedical entities related to COVID-19. How we did that? We did that by doing an automated literature mining. So when we start a particular research, we start literature review, right? And it takes a lot of time. When COVID-19 came, we were in a real hurry. So what we started to think that is it possible to mine the literature, identify the biomedical entities from the literature, try to understand how they are related to each other, and then put that knowledge before all sorts of researchers and scientists all over the world so that they can start getting the basic idea that the literature has provided to us 
regarding different entities, biomedical entities related to COVID-19. And we, we made this knowledge base open source available in, in a website so that everyone can start working from there. So there are several things that we try to cover, disease, drug, gene, uh, and long encoded RNA, miRNA, and protein as well. And the idea was to find out these sort of relationships. So uh, just, just a minute. So disease drug relationship, disease gene relationship, and so on. So we wanted to identify the sort of interaction and associations between these entities so that someone can immediately get an idea what is going on, okay? So here, for example, we try to infer the interactions between disease and genes. We try to identify the associations between disease and, uh, disease and gene and disease and drug and so on. And we had to evaluate how good we are because this is not manually curated. So our, our concept was to do this uh, in an automated way using artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and then try to understand whether we have been successful or not. So there are also many drug side effects we wanted to identify. So how did we go about it? We started with a data set, which was provided by Kegel. Actually, it was provided by LN Institute for AI. So this was called the COVID-19 Open Research Data Set, which had more than 138,000 papers. And basically what uh, these papers all had these keywords in, in, their, in their papers. So COVID-19, coronaviruses, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and so on. So all the coronavirus related papers at that time when we did this were included in this data set. We also had to use uh, different dictionaries like uh, gene HGNC dictionaries, MI, MIR base, and LNC, uh, LNC PDEA, uh, PDB, drug bank, and so on. And we also used a database, which is for the drug side effects and so on. So this is what we do. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, not going to go into the very detail in the methodology, but just to give you an idea, we started by simply extracting the disease and drug names, okay? Then we try to identify the pairs, disease drug pairs. For example, uh, hydrochloroquine, uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, coronavirus. So we wanted to identify these sort of drug pairs. And after we identified this sort of, and we are doing it automatically, it's not a manual curation, okay? So we, after we identified these drug, disease drug pairs, uh, we applied yeah, an anomaly detection pipeline so that we can identify those pairs that are actually outliers, that are not really relevant, okay? So with the help of this anomaly detection pipeline, we remove some of the problematic drug disease pairs. Then uh, we applied something we call sentiment analysis. So what does sentiment analysis mean in this context? So an author has used a mm -hmm. particular disease and drug in his, in, his, uh, in his thesis or in his paper, but I do not know actually whether he wanted to mention that this drug is negatively related to this disease or this drug is positively related to this disease. So when we have identified the drug disease pair, we needed to again automatically identify whether this pair is useful in a positive sense or whether this pair is negative. So it is not useful for this particular disease. Maybe there are too many side effects which has been discussed in that paper and so on. So we applied again an automatic sentiment analysis pipeline, which is based on natural language processing techniques. We use a uh, off-the-shelf software, uh, which is called the text blob model. And we use an unsupervised model proposed by us. From these two models, we find out some properties, which we call polarity and sentiment rate. And we also had some another property from disease drug pair extraction. We include these three features in a neural network model. And with the help of this neural network model, we identify which disease drug pair is positive and who is, which disease drug pair is negative and so on. And we identified this with a confidence score. Maybe we can say that we are 70% confident that this is a good drug for uh, say pneumonia, or this is a good drug for uh, COVID-19 and so on. We did a similar pipeline for disease gene uh, association. Uh, I'm just going a little bit quickly from the methodology point of view. So we identified more than 2000 drugs for 1800 diseases, more than 1900 genes were identified and so on. You can see the associations we have identified are more than 22,000. So there are 22,889 associations for disease and drug pairs. Among them, through our sentiment analysis, we identified more than 21,000 were positive and 1300 were negative. 
Similarly, we had similar association and interaction results for other uh, pairs as well. For COVID-19 specific, we identified at that time, this was published in 2020, early 2020. So uh, we, uh, we found 514 uh, drugs that are related to COVID-19. Among them, 492 were positive and 22 were negative. We identified some gene and mRNA as well, which are related to COVID-19. So I'm going to give you four case studies, just to give you an idea how this would have been useful. For example, through our automated literature search, through our, this, this knowledge base, we identified that uh, dexamethasone can be considered effective for COVID-19. And our system, with 77% confidence, told that this is a positive drug for COVID-19. And in fact, it was also found effective against some other uh, disease, for example, pneumonia, other respiratory diseases, and diarrhea. So from other studies, later we found out that dexamethasone reduces the risk of death from COVID-19 from 40% to 28% for patients on ventilators, and from 25% to 20% for patients needing oxygen. So as you can see, through automated liter literature mining, our system also identified this is as an effective drug. We also identified ivermectin as an effective drug for COVID-19. So in this case, our confidence was around 77%. And it was also found very effective for pneumonia and diarrhea. And from other studies, we also know this is the similar studies have been found later, uh, which also identified in ivermectin to be a very effective drug for COVID-19. Remedisvir as well. Uh, for this one, our confidence score was a little bit lower, 68%. But again, with 68% confidence, our knowledge base could identify Remedisvir as uh, an effective drug for COVID-19. Uh, Interesting thing that we found for hydrochloroquine, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, at that time, there were some trial studies going on and there was a big hype that this could be a very uh, useful drug for COVID-19. But our literature mining showed that this is not very useful. And with quite high confidence, with 65% confidence, our knowledge base suggested that this drug is negatively uh, correlated with COVID-19. So, and, and we identified 111 side effects, including anemia, hemorrhage, liver disorder, and so on. And after a few months, actually, uh, initially, although FDA had previously granted authorization to use the drug for COVID-19, it, it has recently, after a few months of this paper published, we realized, we found out that uh, it is scrapped. So it is not being used for COVID-19 anymore. So these are the four cases that we also mentioned in our paper and so on. So of course, there are errors. I have to... Uh, uh, we have to note that due to inherent limitations of the methods and approach, we have, this is an automated method. This is not manually curated. So we have clearly identified this in the knowledge base. And we also provided a mechanism so that the, the researcher can give us a feedback. For example, if we have failed to understand the relationship correctly, what we do is whenever we show a relationship, we also provide the link to the paper from where we have got the relationship. So the, the researcher, the scientists who are, who are using this knowledge base could go to that particular paper and check whether our extraction of the association and our analysis of the sentiment of that association, whether it is positive or not, he can check it himself and he can provide feedback. Once we get enough feedback, our plan is to make it manually curated based on the feedback of the scientists. We also wanted to include drug trial information, which we couldn't do. Uh, our future task is to have drug trial information within this knowledge base and so on. And we, of course, we want to do periodic updates and we want to do manual curation. So this is about the knowledge base. Another similar study we did, similar in the sense of the methods we have used. So again, natural language processing. So we have used the Twitter data. Again, we tried to find something interesting from COVID-19 point of view. So we probably all know about Twitter. This is just some very basic statistics. So there are 20, uh, 229 million daily active users. This has been reported back in May for the last quarter. So a huge user base. Uh, so people, what they do, they share their various activity information, their moods, views uh, towards particular events and so on. And this was heightened during COVID-19 because everyone was locked down and so on. So during the pandemic period, there were a lot of researches based on Twitter data. I'm just going to mention two researches to give you an idea what could be done using tweet-based research. For example, someone tried to, uh, if a giant tried to identify the most influential author or user in COVID-19 from the Twitter data. Similar research was carried out by Haman, but he only focused on state leaders. 
So, you know, we, we were familiar with many tweets by Trump and other world leaders. So he did a research, very interesting research, where he tried to find out the most influential, influential state leaders. So this sort of research is not new. People do that readily. So what we did, we did a similar type of uh, research. So we use a data set from Tweet, COVID-19 related data set using Twitter API. Uh, Lamsal did a research who provided some sentiment scores for those tweets. So there were 24.5 million tweets during the period 19 March to 17 April 2020, which we use in this research. In fact, at, uh, the, the part I'm presenting here that is based on 9.15 million tweets because we wanted to have an idea about the country, uh, the origin of the tweets. And unfortunately, uh, this is not always revealed. So we had 9.15 million tweets that the country information were available. Uh, and we also only took more, uh, we only took those countries from where we had more than five million tweets because otherwise the analysis doesn't, uh, doesn't mean anything. So we identified 20 countries of which we had more than 500 tweets and we identified 28 US states as well to analyze them differently, uh, separately. So we had, uh, from those states, we had more than 2.74 million tweets. So we did a sentiment based, uh, based clustering of geolocations. So each country, again, very quickly, the method is like this. Each country has been represented by a 30 dimensional data point. Each dimension means uh, the sentiment score of each day of the month. Then we did a, means clustering, a, a very well-known clustering algorithm in, in, in uh, computing science. And then we use some visualization techniques to see what is happening. Another thing we did, we did topic modeling. Again, I'm just going to uh, skip the methodical details just to point out that for the topical modeling part, we had to rely on a smaller time, time frame because this is very, very resource heavy. And because we do not have this, this sort of uh, computing power or resource constraint, because of these resource constraints, we only this for one week timeline. Okay, so I'm skipping this slide. I'm just going to give you an idea about what sort of results can be uh, found from this analysis. For example, to the left, you have a, a, an analysis of the 28, sorry, 20 countries and we divide it, we are able to divide it into three separate clusters. So this sort of suggests from the Twitter data, for example, uh, United Arab Emirates and Indonesian people had a similar mood swing during this period, this period of one month. For example, for the United States states, the US states, we can identify that these sort of uh, states have the, the people within these, these states actually showed similar mood swing during this period. So this is an interesting analysis in the sense when, for example, uh, the policymakers want to, want to uh, do some interventions and so on, they can analyze a post hoc analysis as well. They can analyze how these interventions have been taken by the people. And if Twitter is very, very popular within this particular, within that region, then Twitter data somehow really reflect how the mood swing has been uh, how the mood of the people has been swung and so on. I will give you an example here. Dif for the different clusters of the countries, we have shown some interesting uh, results. This is the uh, uh, average sentiment values. You know, So as you can see, this is very positive sentiment value. And we identified this particular date and tried to understand why this sentiment value is so high. And, and we, we, we found that on that particular day, Oxford University begins uh, began enrolling over 500 volunteers for coronavirus vaccine trial. So this was a very positive report at that time. This is around uh, uh, March 2020. Similarly, you can see here as well, we have a, a high sentiment value. And we all identified that on that day, Saudi Arabia and Arab Emirates escalate measures to contain coronavirus. Here, for example, we have a very negative uh, sentiment. And we, when we try to identify these points, we, we found out that on that particular day, some African nationals, uh, they were mistreated and evicted in China over coronavirus. So the point I'm trying to make is, when we do this sort of analysis, we mostly uh, and somewhat adequately can capture the, the mood swing of the people. Similar uh, analysis were also done on different clusters of uh, US states. For example, here we can see Trump, Mr. Trump signed a $2 trillion aid package 
and we can see that the people were very, very happy. And this was reflected through their tweets. Here, for example, we have a very low point and uh, the United States on that day actually led in coronavirus cases. So, so people were very, very devastated and this was reflected through their, uh, through their tweets and so on. I'm going to skip this slide. This is also the same thing, but this was done in a, in a, in a thematic way. So we identified three different themes. One is based on government actions. And I gave an example about the usefulness of this, for example, how to apply a particular intervention and so on. Then the theme, second theme was medical issue and the third theme was home quarantine. Now we did the modeling and training on the same data set so far, but then we tried to see whether we can generalize. So we took an independent data set. So we, we took a data set from October 16 to October 15 uh, in 2020 in 2020 and try to identify this, we try to run the same pipeline and check whether we can capture the mood swing. And interestingly, you can see here, for example, here we have uh, a very high mood swing, very positive sentiment value. And on this day, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech say the COVID vaccine is more than 90% effective. So this was termed as a great day for science and humanity. And this is captured through this speech analysis as well. So this is that. I'm going to now uh, quickly go into another interesting analysis. I find it very interesting and I, I'm, I'm very excited to discuss this with you. This was a phylogenetic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 strains. And uh, we all know about SARS-CoV-2 by now, so I'm not. I'm going to sk uh, skip this slide. So we, we, most of us probably also know about the phylogenetic tree. This actually captures the evolution, evolutionary history that would be rooted and unrooted tree and so on. So our motivation was to identify the evolutionary relationships among the different strains of COVID-19. That was our main motivation. And we wanted to uncover the spread of COVID-19 across the globe. That was our main goal. Although we are not being able to, have not been able to do this 100% accurately, but I will show you some very, very interesting results. We also have a computing interest. I'm skipping that for now. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to represent the sequences and uh, we, we wanted to find a representative sequence for each country and then uh, construct the phylogenetic tree so that we can, we can somewhat uh, infer the evolutionary relation from which country COVID-19 spread to another country or from which country we got the COVID-19 and so on. Unfortunately, when we did this research, Bangladesh, no Bangladesh strain was uh, deposited in uh, GSAID initiative data set. So we could not use any Bangladeshi uh, genome sequence, uh, age curve sequences. So this is our data set. We took up to 24 April, 2020, uh, 67 countries uh, at that time deposited their uh, sequence data set, uh, sequ uh, sequence, uh, sequences. So in total, there were more than 10,000 uh, age curve genome sequences. And we, we, see, we had serious trouble to handle this 10,000 sequence because of resource constraints. We didn't have enough research to run all the uh, analysis we had to do. but what we did was like this. We started uh, to uh, uh, cluster the genome sequences into different uh, countries. Then we tried to uh, represent it into vectors uh, in a different way. And we had a distance matrix, but this was a very high dimensional di distance matrix. Then we applied to what we call principal component analysis. Many of us know about it. Then we, in, in some sense, we reduced the dimension and then on that uh, 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 reduced dimensional distance matrix, we apply the phylogenetic tree. So this is some results, which is which I find very interesting. So the phylogenetic tree we were able to produce through this pipeline correctly identified China and Italy in the same sibling, in, in the same pair, of course, as the sibling. So we know that this is a well-known fact now that the Italian strain of the virus is believed to be transmitted from China by two Chinese tourists. So this was well captured in our in our analysis. Mm. Similar things we also identified, for example, Germany and Poland. Why Germany and Poland are in the same clad? The reason is Poland's patient zero actually came from Germany. This is also now a known fact. Interestingly, Taiwan and South Korea were also found in the same clad. And we know that there was a Taiwanese woman. We found out uh, after, we, what we did was we, we identified this uh, phylogenetic tree, and then we try to check all the resources, news and literature and so on to identify whether we can explain the relationships we have identified. So we found out that there was a Chinese woman uh, who refused to be quarantined at South Korean airport. And later he was deported. 
But what could have happened during during that period when he was refusing, when she was refusing, she probably had contaminated uh, the disease to some uh, officials at South Korea. Spain and Portugal also was found in the same manner. And the first cases of COVID-19 in Portugal actually originated from Spain. In fact, what happened was on March 2, 2020, a, a Portuguese 33-year-old man working in Spain was tested positive after returning home. And following that, uh, five more cases were reported. So this is why this was also uh, well explained. Now, there is, there is an interesting relationship here. Yeah, this is, for example, China and Italy, you have already seen. But there is, uh, for example, there is a relationship between India and Saudi Arabia. They are, in the, they are under the same ancestry relationship, a little bit far from one another, but there is a relation. Similarly, there is a relation uh, with uh, Italy and India because they are very uh, near to each other. Of course, India and China are also very near to each other. So if you see, if we, if we do the post hoc analysis, we can see that India's first case from, came from students who were studying in China. Also, we identified that there was a 76-year-old man returning from Saudi Arabia, and he became the first death case in India. And there was an incident that as, as there was a Sikh preacher who returned from Italy, and during preaching, he was in fact termed as the super spreader in India. So this somewhat describes why we have found India and Saudi Arabia under the same ancestry relationship, India and Italy under the same ancestry relationship, and so on. Now, this is my last uh, analysis for this one. We identified a number of things. We could not explain some of things. This is one thing that we, we it was beating us all the way. I mean, we couldn't identify any news, at least directly, why Greece and Vietnam is under the same plan. In fact, they are siblings. So what happened was <laughs> Vietnam patient zero, uh, she went to, uh, she left, left Hanoi for London on 15th of February, 2020. And what happens was he, he traveled to Milan from London. So there was a fashion week. There was a fashion week in Milan, which happened during 18th of February to 24th of February. So this lady, uh, Vietnam patient zero, she went to London on the 15th. She traveled to Milan and returned to London on the 20th. So during this period, she were visiting Milano Fashion Week. And then we identify that Greece patient zero actually attended this fashion week. So we, 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 we cannot be sure whether they met in the fashion week, but we cannot deny the probability of them meeting in this fashion week. And this is probably how they, the, 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 uh, uh, this is spread. And this is why our analysis found similarity, very close similarity between the two sequences from Greece and Vietnam. So the point is again, this sort of analysis would actually show you how the disease have spread. And now we have more data and maybe someone would come with more resource uh, constraint and so on and repeat this analysis to identify more interesting relationship. Okay, so now to the last part of my talk, I'm just going to give you an idea about a, a very, very powerful weapon I'm a fan of this weapon, this is for agent-based modeling. I know many of us do modeling. We have mathematical, different mathematical modeling techniques, but I, I, I always try to entice people to work on agent-based modeling. So what does, many of you probably know about it, but in case uh, it is helpful, I'm just going to give a very brief about the agent-based modeling. It simulates the actions and interactions of autonomous agents. It presents a view of their effects on the system as a whole. So there are three components, agents, rules, and environment, okay? So uh, the agents, these are, these are autonomous decision-making entities. So agents interact with environment. So in the environment, the agents operate and interact, and they are artificial and well-defined, this environment. How, how accurately we are able to uh, capture the environmental details, details and the rules, how the, the agents and environment will react, that will actually make your, uh, that will depend, that will uh, actually dictate how successful your model is. So interactions of agents, uh, can be done in different ways. I will show you an example, coherent group behavior from simple rules that are applied. In, uh, this is how the 
emergent phenomena of a system is captured through the agent-based modeling. As a result, any small change in a rule or the environment or the agent behavior will have dynamic effect, dramatic effect. So we can handle many agents. Of course, they, are, could, be, they could be handled aggregately, which we have done for Bangladesh. We could have subgroups and we could have single agent to agent interaction, which is the best case scenario. So the framework is very, very flexible. So this is a classic example. I'm going to skip it because uh, I'm just going to go into the detail of COVID-19 ABM. So this is an agent-based model that we did very early, uh, I think in, in early 2020. And at that time, from the literature, we found this transition diagram, uh, which was published in Lancet, as far as I can, I can remember. So we applied our agent-based agent model on this transition diagram. So what we have to do, so this is our agent. In our system, agent is part of a family. An agent could be one of four professional groups. So he or she could be student, or he or she could be frontline uh, front workers, like health workers, uh, doctor, doctors, yeah, nurses, yeah. and so on. They could be service holders, or they could be homeless, or uh, jobless, or maybe home worker, okay? So then, uh, we identified some activities for the agent. For example, uh, uh, he stays home. If he's, a, if he's a student, he goes to school. If he's a doctor, he goes to hospital. If he's a serviceman, he goes to his work. Then if he, he's a student, he study at his uh, school. If he's a doctor, he treat patients and so on. And then he returns home and occasionally uh, they attend some events. For example, going to a ceremony or something or going to the mosque for saying prayer and so on. These are the events. And at the same time, agents do some activities that are related to COVID-19. For example, they wash hands. This is an intervention, in fact. They sneeze, uh, they contaminate things by touching it, or they come into physical contact with other agents, that is, another human being. So these are the things that defines the environment as well as the rules, how the agents will interact with each other. We had different sorts of parameters and we try to validate those parameters against official data. So this is a result that uh, we, we simulated this ABM for four county of United States. The reason for choosing four county was, uh, four county was very, very successful in, 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 con in containing the uh, uh, pandemic very early. They took very early uh, intervention decisions. Another reason was, as I mentioned, the, the agent to agent interaction is very costly. This is also resource heavy. And this ABM, in fact, uh, does that in every hour. So in each hour, uh, these activities are done. As a result, this is computationally very heavy uh, model. In Fort County, we had around 30K odd uh, population. So we, we could run our model successfully for Fort County. These are the two reasons why we choose, chose Fort County. And as you can see, I'm going to just give you some results to, to show you how these models could be very, very useful. So this was a retrospective analysis. So the blue curve, uh, the blue curve is, uh, the blue curve is uh, the original state of Fort County at that time. And as you can see, if we withdraw the lockdown, what happens? This is the red curve. So the things become very, very uh, problematic, right? If we had lesser protection, so they already had some protection measure in, in hand. So including the, uh, in, included in these protection measures are washing hands, using masks, and so on. So we included all these things in our model. So we can, we can uh, change some parameters, which will reflect that uh, the people are not washing hands frequently. Or we can change some parameters, which will reflect that they are not wearing masks frequently, and so on. So this is how well, we do a retrospective analysis. We, when we show less protection, we can see that the infection increases. When we withdraw the lockdown, we see that infection increases. Okay. So we also did an analysis. No, no. Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Silent for a microphone. Okay. So we also did an interesting analysis on New York City. 
The problem with New York City was the huge population for uh, our model to handle. So we did a scale down analysis. And here as well, we found very, very interesting results. And we introduced the concept of contract tracing here. So you know all of, you all know about contract tracing, and I will talk about this uh, a little bit elaborately a bit later, uh, because I am going to introduce, I'm not going to introduce, I'm going to uh, discuss a concept called digital heart immunity. So this is related to contract tracing. So what we do in contract tracing, we, we find someone infected, check his contacts, and uh, in, ensure that they are all quarantined, right? They are all in isolation. So this is contract tracing. So here, for example, we can see for, uh, for New York City as well, we have, uh, for example, if we have lockdown only, what is the <coughs> result? This is the result, the red, red curve. If we have only contact tracing, then we have the yellow curve. And if we have only extra protection, then we have uh, the uh, blue curve. And if we combine contract tracing with lockdown, then we have a very nice situation where we can contain the pandemic. So this sort of analysis we can do with this model. And here as well, we can show how the contact tracing uh, is useful. For example, if, if everyone is 90% traceable, we have a very, very contained pandemic. Whereas there, if, if there is no contact tracing, then we can see a very severe situation and so on. So here as well, another very interesting thing we identified. The point is, we do not need to trace everyone. Rather, if we focus on tracing the frontline workers, this is the summary of this result, then we have a very good result. For example, if we trace 75% of the people, then this is the result, the blue card. On the other hand, if we press this, this red curve actually means we trace the doctors, nurses, and so on, and 25% of other people, which comes down to a total of 40% people, overall population. So as you can see, if we trace, contact trace, if we have effective contract tracing on 75% of the people, that is worse than if we can have effective contract tracing, including all the frontline workers who are more vulnerable. So this sort of analysis we have done on New York City. And this is a final slide from this analysis. And here I will talk about that concept of digital hard immunity. What it shows, if we have 100% smartphone ownership. So what do we mean by why it is important to have a smartphone? So the, the concept of contract tracing is effective and efficient if we do this with the help of a smartphone. So this is the concept of digital hard immunity. This has been coined by one of the Indian researchers and we took it from him and we started analyzing on it. So the concept is we all know about the hard immunity, right? For example, 70% of us, if we are immune, either <laughs> or to vaccination, then probably the virus will die down. It can be 70, 80 or 90%, that is a debatable fact, but the, pro the, the concept is like this. So digital hard immunity suggests a concept that if, for example, 70% of people own smartphones and by owning, we actually include the concept of contract tracing with the help of that smartphone. So in other words, if X percent, if more than X percent of people own smartphones and effectively contract, contract tracing can be done on them, then we can reach a stage where the virus can be contained because we are containing, we are, we are quarantining all the people who have been in contact with the uh, person being infected. So this this heat map actually gives you an idea about that. Here, for example, here, here for example, it shows the percentage of stay at home service holders. Not all, all, all the people, only the service holders. So here we see if we have 100% stay at home, and we have 100% contract tracing, we only have 5.27% infection. In fact, if we can ensure that 100% will be contract test, then even with 0% lockdown, no lockdown, so there is no one staying home, even then we only have 9.79% infection. So this is a very interesting concept that we, we, we found very interesting. And this is why we started this research to see whether digital, the concept of digital heart immunity could be, uh, could be uh, incorporated in our society and so on. So my last section would be an ABM for Bangladesh. So we started working with the uh, uh, government agency A2I, uh, Access to Information Program. And uh, we uh, 
uh, work very closely with the epidemiologist of Bangladesh and, and foreign epidemiologist, uh, foreign expatriate epidemiologist. And they provided us this state diagram for Bangladesh. So uh, the situation is everyone is susceptible. Then all of them go to the asymptotic, all, I mean, those who are contaminated go into the asymptotic state. Then some of them get recovered. So they probably never tested themselves. They probably didn't understand that they are uh, uh, contaminated. Then some of them go into the mild symptomatic state. The mild symptomatic, you can go to the recovered state. Some of them will go to the severe symptomatic state. From severe symptomatic, some of them will die, unfortunately, and some of them recover. We did not include the possibility of reinfection, but this can be easily included in the model if we just uh, do a transition here. All the transition probabilities and the number of the percent of people who will transit from one state to another uh, were given by the epidemiologist. I did not put it here just to make things very uh, easy to understand. So we implemented two models, ABMBD and ABMSD. The reason for implementing two models is that I mentioned that the ABM that we have just described, it had trouble simulating 30K uh, population. So it is a very resource heavy model. For Bangladesh, we have 16 troll people. We actually try to model it district by district. I'm going to focus on Dhaka here. So for Dhaka, we have uh, uh, 1.6 million, I think, 1.6 million people. So it was not possible to have a direct agent to agent interaction. So we had two models. In one model, we had an aggregated view. So we divided people into age groups and we interacted age groups versus age groups. So for example, uh, say zero to uh, 18 is an age group. So zero to 18 is a population group. They will interact with other age groups and among themselves as well. So this is how I mentioned that there is a concept of aggregated agent. This is how uh, we try to lower the resource requirement of the model. Okay, so I'm just going to very quickly, I'm just going to very quickly uh, discuss some interesting results. For example, this, this was the first validation that we did with our model. As we can see, the blue curve is our model and the red curve was the official confirmed case. We deliberately did not want to follow the confirmed case uh, to the point, to the letter, because this will overfit the model. So this was our first validation and the epidemiologists were very happy with this validation. Then we tried to follow the status quo and here, because we had, as you can remember, we had different, uh, different uh, states. And remember that uh, the official confirmed case, this one, the red curve, this confirmed case is a percent of the mild uh, severe symptomatic or mild symptomatic cases, right? Because none of the asymptomatic agents will go and test, except for some people who are going abroad, very small fraction of uh, total people. So this is how we, we try to identify all the states separately. For example, in this, in this figure, you can see this is the overall infection. The yellow curve is the symptomatic infections, that is the mild symptomatic and severe symptomatic uh, people. And the blue curve is the forecasted case positive cases. That is among the yellow people who have been tested positive. And this is very closely following the actual official confirmed cases. So this give, gave us an idea about, about uh, how actual disease dynamics are going on uh, behind the scene. And in fact, the, the results that we produce here actually matched with the, there, there was a study by IT guys, DDRB with some uh, collaboration with uh, some uh, external funding agencies. They did some studies and they published that study as well. And the number of overall asymptomatic cases, overall infection, including asymptomatic cases, actually matched those results. Here, for example, we use our model to do a retrospective analysis. For example, there is a debate whether we should have uh, put the school closing, we should have, uh, uh, should we have uh, uh, imposed more lockdown or should we have uh, made it more relaxed and so on. So this sort of analysis we could do. I mean, different degrees of lockdown. For example, here, this shows if the lockdown was very, very relaxed at a very early stage, the situation would have been very, very severe and so on. And finally, this is one interesting uh, result, which actually the policymakers asked us to produce uh, during, uh, I think this is, uh, let me just try to show you. This is uh, during uh, 
December 2020. So there was a debate whether the school should be opened during December 2020. So we did an analysis. We, we, and we, we sort of showed that uh, if we open the school, the situation might get very severe. So uh, there were other groups as well who were also doing some modeling and the input from uh, us were taken as a whole and then the policymakers decided not to open the school at that time. So the last few slides, uh, the scale down model. Why did we do the scale down model? Because in the uh, previous model, this one, we cannot have agent to agent interaction. And when we do not have agent to agent interaction, individual interaction, we cannot think about different strains because when you have different strains, uh, a particular strain will attack some particular uh, agent, another strain will attack another agent and so on. And the strain will in some sense uh, uh, propagate, in some sense contaminate in, in, in its own transmission dynamics, okay? So this is why we created a model where we had direct agent to agent interaction but for that we cannot run that we cannot run that for 16 crore people, uh, 1.6 million, uh, uh, 16 million people. So we applied some statistical sampling techniques, and uh, we took only an, a small number of samples with, with which we can provide a very confident output. So then we validated our results. So this is the validation result. As you can see, the scale down model is the green curve. Again, the green curve was somewhat, in fact, better to, to, to uh, follow the official cases. So we were happy with that. And then we tried to model different strains. So we had, uh, you know that we had uh, the beta variant and suddenly that Delta variant came up, which was uh, very devastating according to all studies. So we did not have any idea about how to use the parameters of the Delta variant, okay? How to treat the parameters. So we applied a methodology where we make the delta variant somewhat severe than the beta variant. So for example, we simulated a case where the delta variant is 1.25 times severe than the beta variant. We also simulated a case where the delta variant is 1.5 times severe than beta variant and so on. So this is how we did several scenario analysis to show how things will uh, unfold in the coming days. For example, if you remove lockdown, or if we apply lockdown and so on. So these sort of things we did, and we also could identify which variant is the most dominating variant in which period and so on. So this is the uh, analysis from uh, May 4, 2020 to August 27, 2021. Uh, the, the, the main variant, alpha variant was uh, dominant for, the, uh, for this particular period. Then came the Kent variant, the UK variant, and then beta variant, and then came the Delta variant, which became dominant uh, towards the end. So with this, I am almost at the end of my presentation. So uh, as I was mentioning, I wanted to show you some weapons from computing. And, and I think I have covered a number of them. I have covered natural language processing. We can do many things with this. I have tried to cover AI and machine learning in a number of cases we have done. I have tried to cover some modeling, uh, modeling techniques like I only covered ADM. There were some results on SIR based uh, uh, modeling as well. I'm not going to cover it now here. And I talked about phylogenetic analysis. I hope uh, I was able to uh, instill the idea of doing this sort of work more in your own field as well, where I can, I can be useful and we can work together. And towards the end, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, various internet sources where I have taken various images and so on, and of course the patient audience. And I recall this slide. I mean, I am super excited. I am very much motivated to give, give this talk. I hope that uh, at least you enjoyed uh, what I enjoyed doing, and uh, I hope that we will be able to collaborate in future. Thank you very much.